Welcome to Soul Sessions. I'm your host, Amanda Rieger Green. Thank you for joining me today. And I want to say I am greatly and deeply appreciative of the feedback I've gotten regarding the podcast, the content, the conversations, the insights, and inspiration. It really helps me to know that what we're sharing with you and cultivating is creating curiosity, awakening new ideas, inspiration, and resonating, guiding your path. I love that because that's the intention, is to expand your knowledge, open your heart, get your mind thinking in new ways through new lenses and perspectives, and to discover your own truth, your own voice, your intuition to guide you better in your daily life and living. So thank you. I'm so grateful to hear that. Much received. One of the things that makes me laugh a little bit in saying that is I am not the greatest at receiving attention. (laughs) It is one of those things that's like that reverse ego of when somebody says, oh, I love your purse. I consciously will say things like, ah, I love it too, because my natural inclination is to say, oh, this, I just got it at TJ Maxx and slough it off. So one of the things that I practice is really being conscious about conversations, dialogues, and when somebody offers a compliment or constructive feedback, whatever it is, to be able to really listen and to receive it and to acknowledge it, and not just verbally, But in my heart, in my energy field, to pause and to take it in because it helps to hear that reflection back from other people. And again, whether it's positive or constructive, it's always good for me to assimilate that and to feel it and to know it. And then it helps me better identify with where I am to gauge my point of attraction or my truth. Today, we're diving into astrology. I've got an exciting guest for you next week, Stephen Forrest, who is an evolutionary astrologer and has been has made a great impact on my life and my astrological journey, not only from a soul perspective, a day-to-day perspective, but also from an evolutionary perspective and a psycho- psychological one. And so I hope you, if you're not familiar with Stephen Forrest, you will be next week if you tune in. He's got great tools and resources. So whether you're new to astrology or you have been diving into this or it's what you do professionally, I'm sure you know who he is, but he's a great, great resource, very wise, very intelligent, and has re- guided me in my path of astrology in ways that resonate resonate not only intellectually, but with my soul and with my being and my essence. And that's the gift that astrology has given for me. It is a tool. It is a resource for daily living, learning about my cosmic blueprint, essentially. So I'm going to offer some insights and guidance, a little bit of personal perspective on how I discovered astrology, how it's impacted me the difference between astrology and astronomy. That's where we're going to start. But I'm going to give a high-level overview with personal insights and guidance that can hopefully help you. And there are so many wonderful tools and resources out there. So I will guide and direct you in, in certain ways where you can dive deeper. But I just want to touch on what astrology is, how it's impacted me, and how it can impact you, not only in learning more about yourself, understanding your energetic cycles, your consciousness, your mind, your relationships, your body, your spiritual condition, but also in developing your truth, seeing the evolution of yourself, your soul, and who you are becoming at any given point in time. So what is astrology and what is astronomy? Let's start with astronomy. Astronomy is a science, first and foremost. It's a branch of science, essentially, that deals with the celestial objects out in space and the physical universe as a whole. So it is a study of, a scientific study of those celestial objects. Astrology is a little bit different than that. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue and exchange of energy that has been studied 
for thousands of years. We look up to the sky and people have studied the movement of the planets and their interaction with our planet, planet Earth, and how they also not only affect us as a collective, as a whole, as humanity, large events that occur on Earth, but how they can affect or create conversation or dialogue energetically and personally with us individually. And the American Astronomical Society defines, differentiates between astronomy and astrology like this. So I'm just going to quote them just to give a high level overview. Astronomy is a science that studies everything outside the Earth's atmosphere, such as planets, stars, asteroids, galaxies, and the properties and relationships of those celestial bodies. Astronomers base their studies on research and observation. Astrology, on the other hand, is the belief that the positioning of the stars and the planets affect the way events occur on Earth. So astrology is more conversational. It's more fluid. It's more energetic. It's based in beliefs and an evolving understand of an energetic exchange. The way that astrology works for me on a very simple and fundamental level is just in thinking about the moon. We all know that from plenty of scientific studies, and if you're, if you're a clinician and you work at an ER, you know that on a full moon, the ER kind of goes crazy. We also know that the moon affects the tides. It affects our bodies. Our bodies are primarily made up of water. So naturally, we are responding to that gravitational energetic pull, the ebb and the flow through the cycles of the moon. And the moon has cycles every month that can be tracked. It actually has cycles every day, as do all the other planets. All of the planets in the sky have certain attributes, properties that have been studied and documented over time, correlated with events where we can track certain personality traits, so to speak, of each planet and how they communicate with us here on Earth. So the moon, for example, and if you're new to astrology, the moon is a great place to start before you even dive into your natal chart. We all typically know our sun sign. Some of us relate to our sun sign. Some of us have a challenge doing that. And that's because there's so much more to our personal astrology than solely the sun sign. The sun sign is our vitality, where we find our life force, our energy, and part of our soul's lesson to embody in this lifetime. But we have all these other planets in what's called our natal chart. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But let's go back to the moon. Every month, we tend to have a new and a full moon. There are some months like this month in August, where we started the month out with a full moon, we have a new moon in the middle of the month, and we end the month in a full moon. So we have three lunations, three lunar cycles in the month. But typically, the way it flows and literally is every two weeks we have a moon cycle. We have a new moon and then two weeks later is a full moon. And in between that new and full moon, there are different quarters of the moon, different phases that all correlate and track and mean different things. But if you're new or if you're wanting to start creating a dialogue, repetition, routine, starting tracking your moods, your energy, because the moon represents our moods, our emotions, our intuition, our inner life. It's a great place to start. So you can just simply Google, you know, where's the moon today in the sky? What astrological placement it is in? And it'll tell you, oh, the moon is in Libra right now. It's at 22 degrees of Libra. And if you don't know your birth chart, and I'll give you some guidance and direction around that here in a bit, but then you can know, okay, the moon is in Libra. And if you know just you have a basic understanding of the 12 zodiac signs, most of us know that Libra is about relationship. It's about balance and harmony. It's also about imbalance. It's about justice and fairness, reciprocity, love, finding an equilibrium. So when the moon is in Libra, there is this sense of seeking balance, seeking harmony through beauty, through relationships, and we can feel that. So if you know where the moon's placement is, and if you can find the zodiac sign and the attributes of that zodiac sign, you can say, okay, well, how does this relate to me today? Am I feeling this? Am I feeling 
balanced. But what I will tell you is this, because Libra is seeking balance, it usually experiences imbalance. And I'm a Libra and my moon happens to be in Libra. So is my son. I was born on a new moon. But sometimes when the moon is in Libra for me, I can feel extremely out of balance. And then there's this hunger to seek balance. So it shows me from the inside out, from my soul, from my emotional body, what is seeking balance? What needs this redefining in my life to create greater harmony and cohesion? So it's a simple example. If the moon is in Aries, the opposite sign of Libra, Aries is all about new beginnings, a pioneering spirit, courage, bravery, initiation. So when the moon is in a sign like Aries, there is this sense of get up and go. And it's also a time to move your body, to interact, to jump out, to be, to try new things. It's bold. It's brave. Sometimes it wants to fight. It likes the the more challenging route. When you start to track these things and look at this stuff, it's fascinating. And it can, for me, oftentimes, and I see this with clients and people, it reflects back to me how in tune I am. And is it law? Is it dogma? Heck no. This is how something relates to you. And if you don't relate to astrology, you don't need to pick up this tool. Find tools that relate to you. Numerology, and we'll talk about that late in later episodes because that is the innate language that I speak, that I learned first and foremost, that is just part of my code and my DNA. Numerology may be something you love. You may love the Enneagram. There are so many tools and resources that can help you find some kind of dialogue or rhythm. Astrology has been one of those for me. Specifically, about eight or nine years ago, I remember I had gotten up one morning. I had never been particularly interested in astrology. I knew I was a Libra, but that's about all I knew is that my son was in Libra at the time. I had no clue what a natal chart was, meaning what, where the planets and all the placements of the planets were at the time I was born. That's how we get our natal chart. It's the exact placement of the planets in certain degrees of the zodiac. And it denotes not only the placement of the planets, but it denotes our house system. There are 12 signs in the zodiac, and there are 12 correlating corresponding houses in the zodiac. And the way that that is derived is from what's called our rising sign, our ascendant, where the sun is on the horizon at the moment we are born. And that denotes the house system. There are different ways of looking at the house system, lots of schools of astrology. And I'm talking about Western astrology. There's also Eastern or Vedic astrology. I remember a long time ago, a friend of mine who studies Vedic astrology and is very into it and very proficient, we were talking about just our correlating charts and my Western chart and her Vedic chart. And then we were talking about her her Western chart next to her Vedic chart. And she said, oh, yeah, you're not you're not going to like Vedic astrology. It's just going to like debunk your whole Western system. And I was like, oh, contraire. I love looking at the Vedic astrology because it's just a new point of reference for me to see myself. While the placements, the positions are calculated differently in both schools of astrology, which are both ancient, by the way, they still tell me different things about myself that I can resonate with or relate to. So how did all of this come about for me? My interest in astrology, my understanding of it, I remember very specifically one early morning, I had gotten up to do my journaling before work, and I was sitting having my cup of coffee, and I could feel all these energies welling up in my body. I felt curious and excitable and like something was happening, like electric in my body, so to speak. And I was sitting there, I was reading, I was journaling, and I thought, what's going on in the stars today? I had never in my life asked that question. I thought something's going on in the stars today because I can feel it in my body. And at this time, so many of my gifts for years prior had been developing and becoming more articulate and understandable. And my truth and my intuition, my psychic abilities were firing and wiring, essentially. And I thought to myself, I should look up my astrology today. I mean, I had it just was like as if... I just knew that I was supposed to look up my astrology. I didn't look at my natal chart. I looked at what was going on with the planets today. I don't even know how I knew to look at what was going on with the planets today. I had really no experience with astrology up until that point. 
And for some reason, I Googled, what's going on with the planets today? And sure enough, Uranus, the great awakener, can also be the great destroyer. It d destroys things in order to build something innovative and anew, was creating some aspect with Neptune, which is about universal consciousness. It dissolves things. Uranus awakens and destroys. Neptune dissolves and makes things watery. Neptune is highly spiritual and lucid. It's dreamy. It's, it's the highest level of creative intelligence, intuition. It centers from the heart, but not just our heart within. The heart of humanity, the heart of the cosmos, spirit, God, transcendent things. And Uranus is like shock and awe. It awakens. And in that moment, that's exactly what I felt, whatever the dialogue was. And there's different things called aspects. So there can be conjunctions. It's when two planets are basically holding hands, fusing their energy together. There are squares. There are trines. There, I can go on and on about the different aspects, but they some of them are hard aspects like a square which can mean it creates tension or an opposition. That's when there's two planets opposing each other. That's also what happens when there's a full moon. The conjunction, like I talked about, when planets are fused together, that's a new moon. But the planets also interact that way too, apart from the sun and the moon. And by the way, if you're thinking, Amanda, you're talking about the sun and the moon, and those are not planets. In astrology, we, we consider the sun and the moon planets. And we have the inner planet. So we've got the sun and the moon, which affect us on a day-to-day -day basis, essentially, because they are close in. The sun is at the center of our solar system, feeding us light, energy, intelligence, radiance, nourishment, vitality. The moon affecting our soul, our emotional body, our inner life. So when they create dialogues together, it's this dialogue between the inner and the outer, our vitality, our self-expression, and also the enrichment of our inner life and how those two things come together. So when there's a fusion, like a new moon, when it's the conjunction, the, those energies are fused together and it can be quite powerful. When there's an opposition, there creates a tension and the tension brings us to attention. So back to me and my aha awakening moment. So back to me and my aha awakening moment. I looked this up, there's this aspect between Neptune and Uranus. And I don't remember what it was, but I remember reading about Neptune. Well, what does Neptune mean? And what does Uranus mean? And when they when they create this aspect, what does it mean? What are they, and it was everything that I was feeling, sensing, knowing in my body. And as I started to read, I couldn't get enough. I didn't even want to go to work that day. I could have just read everything there was to know about astrology in a day. But everything I read, I remembered. It was as if... And I don't know if you find this or you resonate with this, but there are some things intellectually, curiously, that we engage with when we're learning something or diving into something where it's like we can't take our minds and our hearts off of it because it's familiar. And that's how astrology felt to me. And everything I read immediately when I read about Neptune, immediately when I read about Uranus, it was like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. Oh, yeah, and this and this. I knew it. I innately knew it in my being. And very rapidly, it was like I began to remember what astrology was and my connection with the stars, the planets, the celestial bodies. So it's almost as if in another lifetime, I was an astrologer. I was proficient in astrology and the study and the discovery of astrology. And it just made sense. And my soul lit on fire. It was awakening. It was Uranus energy. It was intuitive, innate genius. And then there was this wholeness, this disillusion of right or wrong, perfect or imperfect that came with that watery, celestial, Neptunian energy. And it just made sense to me. I would I have known how to communicate and articulate all of that at the time? No. But I be, had this insatiable thirst and hunger for more. And it just rapidly came back to me and became just a dialogue that not only helped me understand who I was, why I was, what cycles I was moving through and seasons, but it also gave me this other tool to use in my day-to-day -day life, in my cycles, my personal and spiritual journey, not only to better understand myself, to know thyself, 
but to be better, to be a better human, to interact better in relationships, to understand my challenges, where I'm flawed, where I mess up, where I might not have the zest or the zeal or the voice and how to cultivate those things, what people to assimilate around me to help bring out certain qualities. So I hope this starts to get you curious. So if you're curious, apart from starting to follow the moon and moon cycles, here's a like a 101 go-to practice. If you want to start 101, follow the new and the full moons every month. We've got a full moon coming up at the end of August in Pisces. What an apropos moon. And it's the second full moon in a month. So we have three lunations. The number three in numerology is the number of creation, curiosity, communication, utter joy. It's, it's, it is such a divine moon. Pisces full moon, which means the moon is in Pisces and the sun will be opposing it in Virgo. And those two planets create beautiful dialogue because Virgo is about practicality. It's an earth sign. It's quality oriented, precision oriented. It wants to figure things out in a very practical, precise manner. Whereas Neptune wants to go into the spiritual, the etheric, the watery, and dissolve all of the formulas. So together they communicate around our physical, mental, and emotional health and our spiritual health. So it's a great time of awakening. Plus we have some other astrological things going on in the sky that kind of illuminate that. So this is a great full moon for curiosity, for diving into something that maybe you haven't explored before. But new and full moons, full moons are about closure. They're about bringing things to completion. They're about illumination because literally the moon is illuminated by the energy and the light of the celestial sun. And if the moon represents our soul and the sun represents our vitality, our soul is illuminated. Things that have been lurking or hiding in the shadows within or proverbially are illuminated, are uncovered. It's a great time of healing, closure, letting go, but it's also awakening and activating. It can create tension. It can create drama. It creates extra energy. But this moon is very important for illuminating innate wisdom, wisdom that may be dormant in your cells, in your DNA. So go out. I encourage you at the end of the month to go out under the moonlight And just stare up at the moon. And even if it's a cloudy night, see if you can find it with your heart. Get creative. Get imaginative. If there's any moon to get dreamy and creative, it sure is a Pisces full moon. Anything goes. Pay attention to your dreams also this moon because Pisces really is the dreamer. And beautiful, beautiful clairvoyance comes through the energy of Pisces. It's almost as if you can see something on a screen. So pay attention to your dreams leading up to and around the full moon. So a couple days before, a couple days after the full moon. So two weeks later into September, we will have a new moon. And it'll be a Virgo new moon, which means the sun and the moon will be conjoined, conjunct, holding hands, fused together in the sign of Virgo. So whatever is illuminated from that full moon, whatever you're creating closure around, the new moon is going to clear a path because you've hopefully done a little bit of work or the moon has psychologically or energetically, gravitationally done a little work on you, whether you recognize it or not. And the new moon is a time, a dark moon of planting seeds. It's not a time of massive action, usually. It's a time of planting seeds, getting clear, communicating intentions so they can germinate in that dark, rich soil, soil of the psyche and the soul. I started with moon cycles, and I will tell you this, pretty much for, I don't know, about 10 years, I I work with the moon cycles. I work with it with my personal natal chart, but I also work with moon cycles as far as really working through things and creating some consistency for myself. Every two weeks, I am either shedding, letting go, recognizing what needs to be healed, what I'm hanging on to, what's limiting me, or I am starting something anew. And I can dive as deep as I want into that. Just I can simply look at the zodiac signs in which the moon, the new or the full moon falls within what's being impacted on that high level plane, which is enough. 
That's a great place to start. But if you know your natal chart, then you can find out where the moon is affecting you personally and what in your house system based on your birth chart, your natal astrology. What is the natal chart? The natal chart is, like I mentioned earlier, it is the placement of the planets at the time you were born. So for instance, when I was born and where you're born to matters, the time and the place ge geographically, because it's all a calculation. And you can Google free natal chart online. There's two or three really great sources where you can find your natal chart and understand your planets if you have your data, meaning the obviously your birth date, the city or location in which you were born, and the time. And if for any reason you don't know the time at your birth, there are charts that will calculate your natal chart. You just won't be able to know your house system because the house system is a very precise calculation depending on where the horizon is, where the sun crosses the horizon at the moment of your birth. So the natal chart. Your natal chart will tell you where the planets were in the sky when you were born. So for example, with me, I was born in Austin, Texas on October 8th at 11.45 p.m. And at that moment, the sun was in Libra, the moon was in Libra, and cancer, the sign of cancer, was dawning on the horizon. And that trifecta right there, there's that number three again. The number three is coming through pretty strong today, so pay attention for threes. If you're out there and looking, pay attention to the threes. That, that trifecta right there the sun represents your vitality, the moon represents your emotional life, your soul, your inner workings, ultimately your happiness. Like, where am I happy? Where is my heart's desire right now? What brings me contentment? And the rising sign or the ascendant is essentially how you dawn on people, how you come across personally at first glance, the mask you wear in the world. And when you start to understand those three aspects of yourself, it helps to articulate greater truths, greater psychological understanding of yourself, your personality, how you limit yourself and how you illuminate yourself, your setbacks and your setups. It is fascinating. And you can Google any of these things. What is my natal chart? You know, what does it mean for me to have my sun in Libra? What does it mean for me to have my moon in Libra? What does it mean for my rising sign to be in Cancer? And there are thousands of combinations of the sun, the moon, and the rising. Take it a step further. And this speaks to when somebody says, yeah, I'm a Sagittarius, but I am, I'm very grounded. I'm very org organized. I'm orderly. I'm practical. I get things done. <laughs> well, maybe your sun is in Sagittarius and maybe your moon is in Virgo. All about practicality, day-to-day -day routines, quality over quantity. That can be an interesting dialogue. So it's not just about your soul's, your personal vitality and identity. It's about where the moon is and where the rising sign is. Taking it a step further, we have all these other planets. And I want to go through the planets very briefly. So we've got the sun and the moon, which we've denoted as planets in the world of astrology. We then have Mercury the planet of intelligence, communication, information gathering, and sharing. Mercury is the ruler of Virgo, which is the practical action of the intellect, and the ruler of Gemini, the mind, the twins, the conversation between the right and the left hemispheres of the brain, communication. Then we have Venus, the planet of love, beauty, relationships, harmony, many other things. Venus rules Taurus, and when Venus rules Taurus, it rules the physical world, the sensual pleasures, beauty, romance, passion, sensuality, sexuality, money, 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 finances, and then Venus rules Libra, relationships, beauty, harmony, reciprocity, fairness, justice, equilibrium. After Venus, we have Mars, Woof! the fighter, the great warrior of the Zodiac. Mars is fiery, driven, determined, the consummate soldier, pioneering new things. Mars rules Aries, that fiery initiative sign. Mars is also a co-ruler of Scorpio. 
And in Scorpio, it's more about transformation, initiation, change, alchemy. But it is about intensity and immensity. Now we're going to start to talk about the outer planets. So the inner planets that affect us more on a day-to-day level are, of course, the sun and the moon. But then Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Those planets are faster moving. Their orbits around the sun are much faster than the outer planets. The inner planets affect our day-to-day, interpersonal relationships, day-to-day life, day-to-day, month-over-month cycles, whereas the outer planets are more evolutionary. That's the way that astrologers usually look at them. They're more evolutionary. They're slower cycles, slower seasons, and they impact our soul's trajectory, our soul cycles, essentially. Different periods of maturation, growth, challenges, all of those attributes. So we have Jupiter. Jupiter is about luck, opportunity, expansion, right place, right time energy. It's about overdoing it and overindulgence. Jupiter rules Sagittarius, which is about expanding our horizons, seeking greater wisdom, the freedom seeker, luck, opportunity, assimilating knowledge, crystallizing it into wisdom. Jupiter also rules Pisces, and Pisces is about expanding the rich waters of ourself, our spirituality, our psyche. Next, we have Saturn, the great taskmaster, sometimes considered the divine father of the zodiac. Saturn is about responsibility. It's about maturity. It's about getting things done, doing them well, or shirking responsibility at that. Saturn rules Capricorn, which is all about responsibility, suiting up, showing up traditions, values, authority, dignity, reputation. You can hear it's a very masculine energy. It's a very earthbound energy of getting things in a certain infrastructure, carrying them out, looking at the day-to-day, but also the long-range goals. It's about maturation, essentially. Saturn is a co-ruler of Aquarius, which is about systems. It's about innovation and the future and creating infrastructure and systems that innovate new futures. Next, we have Uranus. Uranus is the planet that is all about shock and awe. It's about innate awakening, and it's also about destruction. It can be very cataclysmic, but in order for something new, innovative, genius even, to be initiated or created, something else must be destroyed in order to make space. So it's the great awakener and the great destroyer. Uranus rules Aquarius. So while you've got some Saturn energy with Aquarius, you've got a lot more Uranus energy, which is Saturn insight, visionary future, standing apart from the crowd, yet being a part of humanity and inventing a new future that is wiser and brighter and smarter and cutting edge, even if it means debunking old systems, old traditions, old paradigms or foundations. Next, we have Neptune. As I mentioned earlier, Neptune is watery. It dissolves. It rules Pisces, watery, spiritual energies, rich creative energies, intuitive energies, and Neptune since tends to create illusions and delusions. It can be a little bit of kind of crazy making thinking or energy because it dissolves what is not real. It blurs the lines. It creates a sense of oneness, unity, and that is certainly exemplified in Piscean energy. And last but not least, we have Pluto, the not planet planet. Pluto, that little planet way out there, has a lot of energy associated with it. Pluto is the planet of transformation, death, rebirth. It's intense, it's dark, it's immense, but it's not necessarily intended to break us down. It's there to break us through. Pluto is extremely powerful and empowering and alchemizing. It changes low vibrational frequencies into something higher if we allow that intensity to formulate. It rules Scorpio, 
which if you're a Scorpio, you know, you know, if you've got Scorpios in your life, there's an intense, immense energy to Scorpio that is transformative, that holds emotions and intensity long enough to transmute them. That's Pluto. Now, if you think I missed a couple of signs of the Zodiac, you are right, because of the moon, the moon rules cancer. Cancers are nurturing, seek safety, security, comfort. That's what the moon rules. And the sun rules Leo. The sun is all about being seen, the center of the solar system, shining its light and vitality. And one of the things I love most about the sun is it helps us with our ego. And so does the sign of Leo, the healthy expression of the ego or the will, the self-will, and being able to shine, to be seen, to illuminate our light, but also to give light, the generosity of the heart. And that's, that's its rulership of Leo. So I wanted to go through the planets in order to give you just an understanding. The house systems, the first through the 12th house, correlate with each sign. So the first house of the zodiac is governed by Aries, the second house, Taurus, third house, Gemini, fourth house, Cancer, fifth house, Leo, sixth house, Virgo, seventh house, Libra, eighth house, Scorpio, ninth house, Sagittarius, tenth house, Capricorn, 11th house, Aquarius, 12th house, Pisces. So it's sequentially, the numbers are sequential and the zodiac signs are sequential and each one correlates. So if you go and find your birth chart, you can find all the placements of your planets. Where was Saturn when you were born? Where was Neptune when you were born? Uh, and in what house was it in? What are on the house cusp? The house cusp denote the personality uh, or the outfit or the flair you wear around each of those houses and their meaning. Again, I'm giving you a high level overview just to pique your curiosity. There's so much information out there. Find what resonates with you. That's where I want to encourage you most. Google something. And if you read something and it makes no sense, search another place and find something that breaks this stuff down the way that you get it. And don't overload yourself. Like I said, start with the moon, start with your natal chart. That's an easy place to start because once you start, once you initiate that dialogue, people, places, information, dialogues, content will show up that resonates with you at your pace. That's what I love about working with energies is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So know that your teachers and the pace that you learn and the people that will be able to explain things to you. And this isn't just about astrology. This is about any kind of personal development, being on the lookout when you're seeking, when you're searching and when you're ready, open and willing, the teacher always appears. Now, thinking about astrology and evolutionary astrology. I'm super excited because next week I am sharing with you an interview with Stephen Forrest, who has made a great impact, as I mentioned earlier, on my life astrologically. He is an evolutionary astrologist and dives deep into the psychology. And his books, his teachings resonated with me. And I found him early on and I just absorbed his teachings because he spoke in a language and in a narrative that resonated with what I fundamentally knew or was uncovering or rediscovering about myself. And that's how astrology has worked for me. It creates this dialogue. Not only do we have the planets in the sky at the time we are born, we also have the sky today, and there's something called astrological transits and progressive astrology in terms of how my natal chart, the sky and the planets and that fixed chart of exactly what was going on at the moment I was born and how it interacts with the sky today. There are other, other evolutionary ways at looking at this and other interpretations and things you can look at. But if you're more advanced, you know what I'm talking about in terms of astrological progressions and transits and how they interact with you on a, how they interact with us on a universal level and also how they interact with us personally in dialogue with our natal chart. So essentially today, if the sun is in its last degrees of Leo and headed into Virgo. How does the sun in those last degrees communicate with my natal chart? Where I have Leo in my chart, whether it's in a house system or planets, and what aspects the sun is making to my natal planets, along with all the other planets. So there's so many iterations and 
It's a continuous dialogue. And that's how it helps me understand myself. Because when I'm feeling something intuitively, mentally, emotionally in my body, do I always say, okay, let me check my astrology today? No, but a lot of times I'll say, wait a minute, what transits do I have going on? What's going on in the sky today? Ah, this makes sense. Oh, I'm feeling that. And not only does it give me that cohesion of, ah, yep, I was feeling that, or okay, this makes sense. It gives me a roadmap. When we all know with Mercury retrograde, and I'm going to do a little bonus episode on Mercury, Venus, and Uranus retrograde, because there is a cataclysmic galactic event happening in the remainder of August and into September that I want to give you some roadmaps and dialogues briefly around so you can navigate it more intuitively, more intentionally, and make sense of what may feel a little crazy making. But astrology helps me to better understand my inner voice, my dialogue, my physical body, the seasons of life to interpret what I'm going through interpersonally, professionally, spiritually, family-wise, health-wise, and how I can see my blind spots as well as my strategies. The next few months are pretty intense numerologically and astrologically, and they're important. So I will follow up with a bonus episode this week on the retrograde cycles we're having, and I'm going to touch a little bit on the numerology just to give you a sneak peek into some numerology because... August, September, and October are highly transformative months if we are connecting the dots and willing to create some consistency and deliberation. You will see tremendous growth, progress, transformation, clarity over the course of these these months. So I'll give you some tools and resources around that. Additionally, I would encourage you to get your natal chart to check the moon in the sky. Google, where is the moon in the sky? What sign is it in? You don't have to know the degrees and the numbers and what it means, but if the moon is in Aries, if the moon is in Libra, if the moon is in Virgo, okay, what does it mean? Google, what does the moon in Virgo mean? See if you can find those correlations and feel those things. Simply start there. And your second piece of homework is to Google the the full moon in Pisces at the end of this month. Google it, search it. What does the full moon in Pisces mean? What does this full moon mean? And journal about it. See where you can write down some things that you want clarity around, that you're ready to let go of, that you're ready to dissolve in order to reach higher spiritually. Because it is a beautiful shift. And it's not a dramatic shift. It's more of a subtle shift within ourselves and our soul that will become clearer and clearer as we move through the second half of September and into October. So make the most of this energetic time. Be sure to be on the lookout for my bonus episode this Friday around Mercury, Venus, and Uranus retrograde, how to navigate that, better understand it, and better understand yourself. And as always, stay curious. Stay curious, my friends. Last but not least, I actually want to give a little shout out. As we approach Mercury retrograde, we've already got Venus retrograde, Uranus will be retrograde. I have this 18-day meditation dedication that I created, and I channeled it, but it was also very systematically created with some numerology and intentionality and a flow and a framework But it is a morning and an evening meditation that is really designed to rewire, reorient yourself and your psyche. And a great time to dive into a meditation like that is in Mercury Retrograde. It'll help you navigate the the internal confusion, lack of clarity and chaos. But it will also give you this sense of doing something that feels like it is feeding and enriching and soothing your inner voice to create greater greater empowerment and clarity. Uh, for all the podcast listeners, I'm it's got a 20% off deal right now. So I encourage you, if you're into this, to go get it. The You can use the coupon code 20OFF. It's on my website, soulpathology.com. Thank you again for all your support and feedback. And as usual, if you have any questions, please reach out. I'll be doing some Q&A in the next few weeks, so be on the lookout for those bonus episodes. And again, stay curious.